modern day invention would blow your childhood mind? Has the NFL gone too far with this streaming shit, my midlife crisis, and the defense of Reba McIntyre? All that and more today, the number two show. What's up, poopy butts? What's up, stink holes? What's up, glory gobblers? I don't know what we're going to call the fans of this show, but we'll figure it out one day. It's only been a year. One of these days, I'm going to figure it out. I'm excited to be here. Welcome back to the number two show. Took last week off for an impromptu uh, birthday trip that I was taken out of town for. We are back, baby. And this is the number two show sponsored by 18 North Central Tactical Laser Tag, my friends. And we are going to get into that today because I want to talk to my boy who's actually done that before. So let's get it cranked off. Let's get it started. First of all, if you want to call in and talk to me at any point, the number is 818-532-1420. We're going to flash that on the screen momentarily and using the magic of technology and these two fingers. Beep, boop. There it is. Look at that. 818-532-1420. Call in right now if you want to, or call in later in the show during the Tank Talk segment. We'll put you on hold. Just hang tight. If you got something useful to say or need advice on a topic or you want something you'd like to hear us, hear our advice or maybe our opinions on, feel free to give me a call. But right now we're going to start it off with our first segment, which is always the same because I love him so much. It's time for 15 Minutes with Riz. Scott Daniel Rizzuto, welcome, my friend. Hello. Happy to be here. And your time starts now. And let's get it going, then. I was mentioning we have a new sponsor. That is uh, 18 North Central. Oh, love them. Yeah, it's a tactical laser tag, axe throwing. You can see the little logo right here. Pretty cool. Mm -hmm. If you're watching on the YouTube, I went out there and visited this place. Now, there's a few places like this in the country. You have been to one. You've been to this one. This is, like, not... When they, I'll be honest. When they said, oh, come out, because I want to talk about this, man. The fact, so, are you ever amazed uh, by the stuff 13-year-old you would think? Oh, it's the coolest thing ever if I had it then? Yeah, that you yeah. just can't believe exists now. I look at my kid's, like, uh, video game system. Like, he's got a PS5, the boy. Yeah. And I'm like, man, if I had that when I was a kid, or the virtual reality headset, if I had that as a kid... My head would explode. Yeah. What what specifically on PS5 do you look at and go, holy shit, man, that's crazy. Even that, like, Call of Duty game is wild. The gameplay and even, oh, you know what? Here, here's a good comparison. I used to play uh, NHL 94, um, you know, when I was a, a youth. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, now he's got the latest, you know, NHL 2024 game. And my God. Night and day come, as far come. as gameplay goes and how it looks. And it's just amazing. <laughs> come it's like along you're really playing a game. Yeah. Like, we've come I, a long way from Blades of Steel. Yeah. It's, 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 like, it's like you're really playing with real players. Which is so, you know, the amount of work and technology that goes into it. And that's what this place was like from even in real life. I'm like, you know, we had like mall laser tag. We had the old laser tag. I don't know if yeah. you guys... Oh, yeah. Remember that. Let me see if I can find the original. The old mall laser tag or maybe uh, at home. Remember that uh, the that's at what, home version with that's, fo that's, Photon? That's what I'm trying to find. The at home laser tag. Nah, I got to put 90. Was it there. Photon? I, I think it was called Photon. Where the, uh, the guns look like dildos. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about these. Can you share my screen real quick? Let's see if we can get this full screen so Riz can see it. Uh, remember yeah. Remember these? Yeah, I do. These are the ones I remember. They kind of look like, is that what you're talking about? No, look up Photon. P-H-O-T-O-N. Yeah, what kind of bullshit were you playing as a kid? Let's uh, it had like a pack, like you att att attached to your pack, like uh, there was like a pack you put on your chest. And uh, um, put Photon laser tag. Photon in. laser tag. Yeah. See if those uh, <laughs> those do look like dildos. Right? Yeah, they look like holy uh, smokes. Look at these dildos. Things. See if you can share that screen. Yeah, put that screen up. Yeah. There we go. That's the photon. Uh, and the, the craziest thing is, you, for these to work, you had to squat on them, which was <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, the uh, you had to put a sensor way up your butt, and that was the only way. Uh -huh. <laughs> and it vibrated when he got hit. And let me tell Wild. you, this did not take off. Uh, this was not Hasbro's greatest hit. Hey, different times, my friend. It was. Now, see, I had this other one. Let's see if we can just find laser tag commercial. Well, I know you're going to do a comparison to uh, what they have up there at 18 North Central. Yeah, let's talk about that. And it's I, I wouldn't call it laser tag. It's a, it's, it's a tactical... Uh, it's a tactical experience. Yeah. Like, it's not even close. Like, watch no. this commercial. Here we go. Share my screen. Let's watch this 29-second laser tag commercial. Make sure my volume's up. I thought this was... This looked so cool. Oh, yeah, at the time. Yeah, you just had, like, this little thing you wore on your chest. This was a weird time in the 80s where everything got sold with this, like, uh, dystopian future looking. Laser yeah. Tag, the game that moves at the speed of light. Yeah, that's the at home the one. Or even when you went to, like, a, the when you went to a place that had, you know, uh, a laser tag facility and it had, like, the black right. light. You know, you could always tell the dirty kid because they're. they're <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Because their clothes were gross under black lights. Damn. Their clothes. Like, Dude, why are your jeans glowing? Ah, uh, no reason. Huh? <laughs> what dude are you what have you been doing in your room by yourself <laughs> nothing uh, nothing uh the black light doesn't lie but at 18 north central um they have an indoor facility i, I haven't played in the outdoor one yet but they built like a two-story town yeah in the uh in the in the uh inside one it looks like you're in a market and yeah like a market somewhere in the middle east yeah kind of and I tell you, you, walk in there, you go, damn, dude, it's cold in here because I got the AC running. Oh, yeah. And then you leave there, I mean, drenched in sweat. Get into it, huh? Oh, man, you're running around. You're sore the next day. You're like, why am I sore? Because you were running, you're jumping, you're hiding, you're you got, you're got, holding these heavy-ass guns. Yeah. That's eh, so cool. The guns are crazy. He was telling me, like, I picked one of these guns up, and they look like, I mean, they really just look like an AR-15 or something. Yeah. They kick. They have a CO2 component. I mean, dude. You're used to the thing that sounded like the pew, pew, pew. You're playing laser tag in the mall, and there's like, uh, there's some glow in the dark stuff on the wall, but yeah. really, there's not much going on. And this place is like, you're getting in full ta helmet, vest, all sensors so cool. everywhere. So and cool. The guns are sighted, and they got a little red dot scope. The guns are sighted where you can like put the dot on people, like the Predator. And the guns, he was saying, I was asking him, you know, this place is a destination place. Like, the guns are like 1500 bucks a piece. Yeah. And they they kick, and you have to load, and you have to go back. Like, you run out of ammo. Oh, you throw a magazine in. And you got to throw a magazine in and get a fresh mag. Like, it's... It's, it's wild. Yeah, it's very realistic and very, very cool. Now, 15-year-old Riz oh. would say, you like, a summer, like, take all my money. Bro. I'd be there the, the entire time. The entire summer I'd be there. I, yeah, man, me and my, we were obsessed in the nine, maybe it was a nineties thing. I don't know, but my, my friends and I were just obsessed with like, we played BB gun wars, which was the closest thing poor kids could afford, which I don't recommend. That's not safe. No, we just go out in the woods and I was the poorest of the poor kids. So I had a red rider and I remember my friend ordered an Uzi out of the back of a comic book. It was like, a, <laughs> and it had a CO2 in the handle. And this thing could shoot 100 BBs as fast as he could pull the trigger with CO with the CO2 oh, pressure pushing him out. And he, like, pinned me in a creek. It just wasn't fun, man. He pinned me in a creek bank, and I'd just hear, like, <laughs> there's, yeah. like, in the mud. There's, like, little lit BB up. holes. I'd just be getting lit up, dude. And then I got my little Red Rider, like, Ralphie from the Christmas story, like, and it was so weak that I could I had to arc it. I could see the BB come out of the thing, and I had to, like, watch it, like, even if I hit someone, yeah. it was almost like tapping them on the shoulder. And besides the, the most obvious, like, all right, my iPhone is something that would blow me away if I were a kid. Yeah. What What is the one, if, if you could pick one, one thing, you can only pick one, that if you went back in time and you told 13, 14-year-old Rafe, hey, make it to 2024 and this will await you. Dude, I... What year? How old? 15? Yeah, 13, 14, 15. Man, that's... Young teenage you. 
what awaits you uh, in 2024? Like, hang in there, buddy. Like, uh, you, you're just giving yourself a pep talk. Like, yeah, you're giving, you're giving the, you know, uh, past you a pep talk. Like, hey, dude, it's going to be cool. Here's what you have to look forward to. This one thing. I mean, you nailed it with video game. I mean, if you'd have taken, I, I've talked about this before, maybe on, in other conversations, but like if you took an Atari controller when it was just a stick and a button, it was just a joystick with one button. If you took that out of my hand when I'm playing like River Raid, you know, or Pitfall, and then you just handed me a PS5 controller, I honestly don't think my central nervous system could. <laughs> right now. The jump would be so wide. The chasm of what my brain was trying to process with all those. Because I remember when Sega Genesis, I was like, three buttons? Yeah, crazy. Uh, I'm not a robot, dude. And then they had the, they had the two rows next. They like came up to like two rows of buttons. Super Nintendo had buttons on top, and I'm like, this has gotten out of hand. This well, literally we got eased, out of hand. We were and and you know you you get handed a PS5 controller now, and there's four thousand buttons on it. Yeah. Um, we were eased into it. Yeah. Uh, there was one button, then two buttons, and three buttons, and four. Fine. There was a gradual progression to what what we have now. Yeah, and I mean I, that would have been mind blowing. I think. But what about game change? Like you don't play many video games now. No. But, but I what, wouldn't have known that then. Sure. Um, you know, someone in the chat said, hey, man, hang in there. In 2024, you can pay $12 a month to look at a chick's butthole. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, that is mind-boggling. <laughs> All the porn. Oh, yeah. I mean, hey. I'm just being honest. I know that's the cheap answer. But, like, it when porn, when you used to hide Playboys in a trash bag in a hollow log. Or in a sh shoebox that you put in a drop ceiling. Yeah. And you're like, oh, the hollow log is the internet, and every there's it's you can stuff it full. And of, the log is loaded. The log, <laughs> it's a never, that log will never. Because when you were a kid, I remember we stole a bunch of Playboys out of this. And I felt bad, dude. We were just kids. We didn't know any better. We stole like a bunch of classic Playboys out of this guy's. Like storage facility. It was like the Marilyn Monroe issue. It was like stuff that was probably worth money. Probably today. worth a lot of money. We saw a Playboy. We didn't care. They were, we just took a big stack. We like hid it in two hefty lawn bags in the woods, stuffed it in a hollow log, and we're like, all right, nobody tell anyone else. This will last us. You know, you can look at it here. You can't take it out of the woods. And just slowly, we betrayed each other. Like yeah, like a heist movie, dude. The porn just started disappearing. Um, everybody take it home, Trevor. No, no, exactly. Somebody stole it. Yeah, everybody just dwindled away quickly. We were like bank robbers who blew through our 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 score in like six months. So to know, you know, that that hollow log would forever be full. <laughs> it's wild. That's pretty wild, man. I, I know that that's like a fuck. Not a very well thought out. No, you know what? Even I wasn't thinking about it, but that shoebox that was hidden in the drop ceiling, if I told, you know, past me, like, hey, dude, hang in there, that shoebox will never be not full, and it'll be every every time you open it, it's going to be something different. Yeah, like, ima like imagine every time you open this Playboy magazine, the pages were different. Yeah. There's just a new naked woman or a new, and I mean, it's not even Playboy. It's so more far advanced than that. <laughs> But, and you know what? You're going to have it constantly in your pocket, and you could pull it out whenever you want. Yeah. But you need to have some, hey, little Riz, you got to have self-control because you can't just pull it out anywhere. You got to, you know, you got to pick and choose your spots. I know, man. Because that, you know, if you're thinking like 14, 15-year-old testosterone coursing through his his veins going, <laughs> you mean I'm going to have it everywhere? I can look at it wherever? Yeah. I'm like, no, dude, you got to have some self-control, buddy. Yeah. I mean, it's wild. I, the other thing that I think would be mind blowing would be like drones delivering. Like you wouldn't, if I was like told fifteen year old me, like, "Hey, dude, there's going to be like little tiny helicopters in a company called Amazon, and you can just your groceries will just get brought to your house." Yeah, like within within a couple hours. Yeah, or even like just Taco Bell getting delivered. Yeah, you don't have to get on your bike and go there. Just. So many things we take for granted, even bitch about, which it, I mean, it does suck. There's things that suck about those companies, but sure, uh, we're we're keeping a positive, Rafe. I know. Um, I'm saying there's so many things that even though they suck, the fact that they're available would have blown my mind. <laughs> I spent a lot of money on compact discs. 
Oh, yeah. When I was, you know, you scrounge up. And compact discs were, you know, CDs were what? S between 17 and 20 bucks. They weren't cheap. They were not cheap. And that was a lot of money for a, for a young teenager. If you were to tell me that, hey, man, hang in there. Soon, there's going to be every song you ever wanted. At the t whenever you wanted to hear it, mm -hmm. in a little device that's going to fit in your pocket, that would blow my mind. Yeah. Legal weed? Oh, that's, yeah. I mean, that's not even a technological advance. That's just a societal we're, advance. The, listen, we're still new to that with the, with yeah. the legal, especially here in, in the state we live in, Missouri. Um, the fact that, you know, every five miles is another dispensary. I'm still trying to wrap my head around that. That's still so new. Yeah, man, there's a lot of stuff that, like, we didn't get all the things we were promised, you know. The flying cars, we're getting close. They I'm okay with that. I'm, I don't need – listen, people can't drive on the ground. And you going to put cars up in the air? That's why I don't I want, think so. That's why I want to get away. Uh, Jetpacks, I'm fine with a car. Yeah, I don't need that. I, I mean, I would love a jetpack. That would be sweet. I would rather have uh, all the music I want on my phone mm -hmm. than a jetpack. Ask me what I would use more. Probably the, the the music. That's true for a guy like you. Uh, I could see that. I, it's uh, it is definitely wild to see. And that was the other thing. Uh, at this 18 North Central place, they have axe throwing and stuff like that. And that even that, when I went out there, they had added on these layers of tech that like. Because I'll be honest, dude, axe throwing never really appealed to me. To be like, uh, I don't want to go do that for an afternoon. But then I saw it, and I'm like, oh, they project. If you could make it better. Well, they project, like, video games onto the axe boards, and you can, like, play where you're, like, zombies are coming at yeah. you, and you got to hit them with the axe. And it's like, it responds in real time. And I'm like, dude, this is – because I remember when you would go to the arcade, right? Like, to compare it. I remember when the Terminator 2 Judgment Day arcade game came out. Yeah. And it had the like the two Uzis built into the game mm -hmm. console that would pfft, would yep. kick, dude. I had to put. I don't know how much money I had, but I bet I, three quarters of my money went into went that, that machine for a summer of just because you know you you die in like forty five seconds and have to put yeah, more money. Damn in. another, and that's and that's probably a seventy five cent game too. Three tokens. Oh yeah, you're putting tokens in, and it's wild, but man. Yeah, we're there, man. We've come a long way. All right, I got to go a long way to my office, and then I have things to do today. So, Damn, uh, we already hit 15. 15. Wow, I, gave you, right. I gave you an extra two minutes, buddy. Well, don't do that. Just get the hell out of here. I don't ever want to take it. You're a busy man. Well, listen, we've got things to do. All right. All right, I'll see you guys. Say goodbye to future Riz. Bye. All right, well, we did it. We, uh, we talked about uh, laser tag and hollow log porn and that's just the first 15 minutes of the show, folks. So we're going to come back after a quick break. A word from our sponsor, AT North Central Tactical Laser Tag. All right. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you so much for sitting through the through those advertisements that help pay for this free show you watch that you will inevitably complain about somewhere in the comments. But that's okay. I don't like watching them either. I'll be honest with you. I got pissed off yesterday. Because the Chiefs game was on, and I had to – the NFL's out of control, all right? They're just – they got us going on all – I'll get to it, all right? Let's get into the segment before I start complaining. This segment that we're about to get into, and I am going to bitch as soon as it starts, it's called the Annals of History. From the Annals of History. Yeah, I don't know if we're pronouncing that right. I don't care, see? Yeah, see? I don't care. I, speaking of history, I can do this tie-in, baby. I get pissed off. Look, I'm a pretty progressive dude, but the, the last little trace of Neanderthal DNA in me is I love watching professional American football. I love watching the NFL, dude. I enjoy it, okay? What I don't enjoy is that you used to be able to just turn on your TV and it was on 3, 6, and 12, all right? Or whatever your fucking channels are, 2, 8, and 9. I don't know what your local affiliates are, but it used to be on ABC, CBS, and NBC. And they'd fight over the contracts, but every game was on those channels. 
Well, not anymore. Not in today's. So once you cut the cord, cut the cord. Eh. Yeah, well, you cut the cord, and guess what? You got to get 20 new cords if you want to watch the fucking NFL because the games are on 27 days. Amazon's got games. You got to have ESPN. Then last night, I was just trying to watch the Chiefs game, right? It's a Monday night game. I turn on ABC. It's Dancing with the Stars, season 8,000. I'm like, great. Don't care about this. Didn't care about it in season one. Definitely don't care about season 8,000. Why is this on Monday Night Football time slot? Do not like. Me no like. Ug no like. So I'm like, where the hell do I watch the game? It's on ESPN, which is now part of Hulu and Disney and this whole bundled package. But then I go to my Disney. I can't get in there. I'm like, all of a sudden, dude, I'm like a fucking hacker, dude, just trying to get in to any account I can to watch a football game that used to just be on TV. I like some of the improvements that technology has made in our lives. Riz and I talked about it in the opening, but some, there are some drawbacks, right? You got to have, uh, you know, if you start adding up all your $7 subscriptions and your $12 subscriptions and your $15, you're paying way more than you paid for cable. Way more. When they were like, cable's fucking us. Let's fuck cable. It's like, yeah, we did. We fucked cable for about a year. And then all the streamers were like, well, what if we did some fucking of our own? And then now we're getting, I got HBO Max. I got Hulu. I got Disney Plus. I got Netflix. I got fucking Peacock. Now I have YouTube TV. Thank you. I know I'm on YouTube. I like YouTube TV, but I had to get that. And thank God for YouTube TV. I'll say that. And I'm not just kissing ass on this platform, okay? I'm telling you, that was the only place I could find the game. I tried to sign into my Disney account, wouldn't let it happen. Tried to sign into my Hulu account, wouldn't let it happen. I'm just like, what the hell is going on in America that I can't just watch a fucking football game on a Monday night? It's the only game on. How is it not taking some sort of precedence? Oh, I'm sorry, dude. I, I didn't want to watch Danny Amendola, former St. Louis Rams slash Patriot slash L.A. Ram do the cha-cha on ABC. Well, I wanted to watch an actual football player on an active roster play football. And I got to sign up. That, so now you just look at all, the, all that stuff, right? Amazon, Hulu, Paramount Plus. If I, I don't even want to add all that shit up. And then to get YouTube TV, that's like 60 bucks a month, with, with, which was the cost of cable to begin with. So now if I keep that, which I like it, I'm paying like 200 bucks a month in subscription services. And it's like, you got to sign. There's two-factor authentic authentication codes. Sometimes I just want to turn my fucking TV on and I just want something to be on, okay? Remember that? I hate to be that guy, but do you remember when you just turned your TV on and something cool was on and somebody else curated it for you? And you didn't have to go through 30 minutes of scrolling and to find a show. And it's like, because you liked, uh, and it's so wildly off, so wildly off. Be like, because you liked American Horror Story, maybe you'd like 500 pound sisters. And I'm like, that is what? Those aren't related. And yes, I love that show, but that's irrelevant. I guess my point is that I was very upset last night because money's tight, dude. We're living in a recession, you know? I got to figure out what I want to keep and what I want to get rid of. And it's like, there's always like one show. Oh, Apple TV, I got that too. I, the more I sit here and think about it, dude, I am, I maybe I need to get that Rocket Money app. They're not a sponsor. Rocket Money, hit me up. Maybe I need to be looking at that shit because I'm like, I might be five grand a month in the hole on subscription services at this point. I have no clue because I get upset and then I sign up and I'm like, I'll cancel that later after I watch what I want to watch. And then three years later, I'm like, holy fuck, I've been paying this whole time. Anyway, that's even what I wanted to talk about the annals of history. That just spurred me off. But anyway, if you want to call in, bitch about your subscription services. <laughs> Welcome to, 
no. What are you doing? Wrong, wrong one. Let's get the other up, the phone number. That is one. 818-532-1420. That's 1-818-532-1420. Feel free to give me a call here at North Central 18 Studios, where we will talk about subscription services and why they cost too much money. It does bum me out, though. And then uh, there's nights that I'm like, I can't find anything to watch. And I'm like, that's insane that I pay this much money for stuff, and then it's still nothing of interest. A lot of fluff. And I think it's hurting, in my opinion, sometimes I wonder if the variety is hurting art because so many things get, can like, you, they used to, like, premiere shows on the networks, right? And, yes, it sucked. There were a lot of gatekeepers. There's probably a lot of good art that was being kept from being made, and I'm glad we busted down those walls. But at the same time, you know, shows caught on. They were given time for people to discover them and find them, you know. Like, I, you know, a lot of the biggest sitcoms did terrible their first year. And then they found their audience year two, year three. You know, they found their first audience, but it was small. They were given time to grow. And <clears throat> now it's like, if you don't have a hit out of the gate, I almost don't like watching something in the first season because you get into it and they're like, nah, it's canceled. Wasn't making any money. There's so many things being made that it's so hard to cut through the clutter that there's like a lot of good shows that never get off the get off the ground because people don't see them in time. Then they're canceled. And the next thing you know, you're like, well, I guess I'm never going to know how that cliffhanger of season two ended when the guy got sucked into a time travel vortex. I'm heavily invested. I'm 27 hours into this thing. <coughs> Excuse me. And I'm never going to know what happens. I don't know. It really pisses me off. But what I wanted to talk, wanted to talk about a little bit in this segment, and I don't even know if we have time now. I just went on like a 10-minute rant about um, streaming services, which is insane. Uh, once again, the phone number is 818-532-1420. If you'd like to chit-chat with me, feel free. Uh, if not, that's okay, too. Or leave something in the uh, leave something in the chat. Maybe we'll uh, we'll chat it up. I, had, uh, I wasn't here last week. I'll talk about that. <clears throat> I had a wild experience last week. I turned 46. Speaking of history, half my life is in the rearview mirror. I won't live to 90. I started really, this is a birthday that really hit me hard, guys. I don't know if anybody else out there's, you know, hitting those years. 30 didn't bother me. 40 didn't bother me. I like my 40s more than I like my 30s. I feel a little more actualized as a human. I, You know, <clears throat> I'm not sitting here. There are certain things. You can't trust a fart after 40. That's a fact. That is a fact, guys. You fart after 40. Any fart after 40, you could be moving product. It's not a guarantee, but there's no guarantees left. Like your O-rings are just stretched out enough at that point. <clears throat> you know. If you're, you might, you just might be pushing a little bit. I'm not saying enough, not enough, uh, you know, to where you have to move or get a new job, but you might have to throw your underwear in a trash can in a public place. You might have to sneak away at the office and like bury your underwear under a bunch of paper towels and then free ball it for the rest of the day and hope a second fart doesn't come along and really fuck your day up. But I don't have a lot of the aches and pains or, anything like that um it's just i started thinking about <clears throat> and i think this didn't help hold on a second <clears throat> sorry i didn't bring a water and i did a lot of screaming on the number one show today in my throat i just i don't have aches and pains and then i'm like hold on <laughs> oh my god i'm dying up here and i am dying we're all dying existentially Let's let that sit in for a second, guys. If you think about it, every second that you watch this program, every word that comes out of my mouth is one tiny tick closer to imminent death for all of us. Isn't that nice? You ever drive past a graveyard and think, lucky? <laughs> yeah. Got real sad there for a second, didn't it? 
Let's sit in it. Let's sit in it. Some of you are watching live. Some of you are driving in your car right now. This is pre-recorded. So even more time, even more time is clicked off. You're driving to a job you hate. Maybe riding with somebody in the car that you're not even in love with anymore. <laughs> Don't wait, man. Make a change. Let me be the inspiration. Let me tell you. <clears throat> 46 hit me hard. It's the point of this story. Where do I get a number two show hat? We'll get to that later. 46 hit me hard because here's why. Chris Christofferson, one of my heroes, died the weekend of my birthday. Wasn't happy about that. When somebody like that, when somebody like the great Chris Christofferson, dude, this dude Rhodes, he's lived so many lives. <clears throat> he seems larger than life to me. Rhodes Scholar served in the Army, helicopter pilot. He flew helicopters onto oil rigs, dude. What a crazy job. And then he quit everything to, in his, much like myself. I didn't start comedy until I was 33 years old. And by all accounts, that was too old to get into an ageist business. But here I am, doing, doing okay. I'm in the top 5%. I may not be, you know, Kevin Hart, but I'm earning a living and I'm having a good time. And I'm here hanging out with you guys, and I'm always grateful for that. But <clears throat> you start thinking about other parts of your life, you know. When someone larger than life like that who is a hero to you, who seems like they transcend death itself, dies you start questioning your own mortality i mean chris christopherson was one of the toughest guys he was a model of character to me he was a man who stood up for his principles he was a man uh who took chances you know <clears throat> he became a janitor at sun records in his 30s after living all these lives coming from a military family going to west point went to harvard it was a road scholar gave all that up to become a janitor so he could Get into country music. Well, the longest shot of all long shots, you know. And he's, like, passing songs through other people trying to get Johnny Cash to record. And eventually he had one weekend, and everyone's heard this story, you know. Two stories I love about Chris is once is he landed his helicopter, and he was a National Guard after he got out of the Army, and he just took a helicopter, and he landed it in Johnny Cash's yard, and he dropped off the song Sunday morning coming down. Dropped him off a tape. What a ballsy move, dude. Almost crashed the helicopter into Johnny's house when he did it. But it worked. Johnny Cash listened to that tape instead of throwing it in the trash. Recorded Sunday morning coming down. Next thing you know, Christofferson's got a string of hits. He's writing for other people. He's writing for himself. He's got himself a career in country music. The longest of all long shots. But he bet on himself. And I respect people that bet on themselves. And that's kind of wild to me. Uh when somebody like that, somebody that's larger than life like that passes away. Another story I love about Chris is they're playing some event. <clears throat> I don't know if it's true or not. I believe uh, Ethan Hawke told this story. So it was some big event. It was like Willie's nine, one of Willie's birthdays or something like that. It was a big event. And Toby Keith was on stage. And, you know, Toby Keith is notoriously like a panderer. I'm not saying I hate Toby Keith, whatever, but like, you know, he's one of those guys that's just like, we'll put a boot in your ass. It's the American way. I like the army and I'm not totally gay. It's just like he's, come on. We get it, dude. RIP Toby Keith. I like some of your music, but in some ways he was a little over the top, uh, you know, with his toxic masculinity having really done nothing. He came off stage at some event. You know, he played one of his boot in your ass, red, white, and blue. I'll, I'll hit you with the Bible. And then I'll punch you in the face with a... <laughs> punch you in the face with a slice of apple pie. Whatever other pandering American word cloud you can come up with. Uh, some unoriginal, uncreative writing. And... uh came off stage and he was saying something to Willie. He said something. He said, Chris Christopherson, none of that lefty shit, Chris. And Chris is an old man at this point, dude. And he goes, 
what the fuck did you say to me? <laughs> and they said it got really tense, and he said, turn around. And Toby Keith walked off and muttered something, and Chris Christopherson said, turn, don't turn your back on me, boy. He goes, I'm fucking talking to you. And he turned around, and he goes, what would you say? And he's like, you heard me. I said nothing, you know, keep it. Keep that lefty shit out of here tonight. And he said, you ever fight for your fucking country, boy? You ever put on a uniform and be asked to kill another man? Because I have. That's what I thought. You haven't done shit. So he's like, you shut your fucking mouth and you go to your dressing room. And I'll do whatever the fuck I want when I'm on stage. And basically dress Toby Keith down in front of all of these legends of outlaw country. And I'm like, that. That's a real motherfucker right there, dude. And I'm not trying to be too, too crass here. But he said uh, Toby Keith stormed off, and uh, Ethan Hawke was like, man, you just lit him up in front of Willie Nelson and all these country music legends. And he said, well, Willie just laughed, and Chris gave him a look, and he said, you know what Waylon Jennings used to say about guys like Toby Keith? And he said, what's that? He goes, they did for country music what pantyhose did for finger fucking. <laughs> Hell yeah, dude. <laughs> That guy died, and it affected me, okay? That's a cool guy. That's a guy that he doesn't give a fuck. He's going to say what he has to say, and he's a brilliant writer. If you go back and listen to his songs, he can't sing for shit, but he still had a musical career. It didn't matter because the stuff that he wrote was so impactful. The stuff that he, what he had to say transcended whether or not his voice was the right voice to say it. There are some artists like that. Leonard Cohen, uh, Tom Waits. There's a lot of people out there who have unique voices. I wouldn't say they're strong singers, but Chris Christopherson fell in that category. He went on to have a film career. He was Whistler in Blade. I can't imagine anyone having that, playing that role. But he had, uh, somebody said Toby shouldn't have let that slide. What would Toby have done? He's got a lazy eye. He, couldn't, he probably saw two of Chris. Chris would have slapped the shit out of Toby Keith. Get out of here, man. Get the hell out of here with your Toby Keith. Not hating on Toby. He just was out of line. He got what he got. Chris was right. He hadn't done shit. He never put on a uniform for this country. He never done. All he did was make money pandering. Nothing wrong with that, if that's what you want to do. But don't dress down an actual veteran and an actual hero and an actual songwriter. Or you might just get your little nuts clipped right in front of everybody. And that's what happened with Toby Keith. He got his little, he got a Chris Christopherson vasectomy right there in front of everybody. And that's okay. I guess my point is, you know, he was one of those dudes that just transcended character and transcended uh, art and was a brilliant writer. I looked up to him in so many ways. It really had a profound effect on me that he died specifically <clears throat> on my 45th birthday, because let's be honest, there's been a lot of things happening in medical uh, technology and medical advances. You might live to 100. There might be something that breaks through in the next year that prolongs my life. But I've had a pretty hard life. I put some miles on the chassis early on. I'm not going to lie to you. I put a lot of hard miles on this body Uh I like to say that I took my retirement first. So I just spent my 20s living it up like I was in Boca Raton, just drinking and partying and <clears throat> just responsible enough to take care of the basics of my life. And I regret that in a lot of ways, but it is what it is. It happened. So with all those miles on the chassis, 90 would be a pretty good, sh if, you know, if I make it to 90, I'll have done something. And I'm 46, so that means that birthday, I'm using 90 as the metric, as the hopeful metric of like, if I hit 90, hallelujah, brother. So using that as the metric, I had to uh, see in front of me an hourglass of my life filled with sand and I watched a grain of sand fall to the bottom in which the bottom pile of sand is now larger than the top. And that is an existential moment for any human being. If you'll have that honest conversation with yourself where you're like, holy shit, 
it's still the summer of my life, but the winds of fall are a-blowing, right? It's late June, early July for old Captain Pork Steak, if he's lucky, if I'm lucky. July 4th just happened. August, the dog days of August are right around the corner. And then it's going to be the fall of my life. My hair's getting gray, you know? Yeah, am I aging into a silver fox? Fuck yeah, I am. That's great. I look good for my age. But I still had to come to terms with the fact that, you know, a little bit of uh, a little bit of um, a little bit of time is slipping away. So I was trying to like deal with all that, right? I'm like, God, Chris Christopherson's a hero of mine. I love this man. I'm 46. My hero just died. I'm grappling with the fact that my life is half over. It's my birthday's hitting me hard, and I'm like, I don't really know. Am I doing the things I want to do? Have I told the people I need to tell that I love them? Have I been, I, you know, I believe that the service we provide is the rent we pay for the space we take up here on earth. That's why I always try to say be useful, you know. But also understand that you have intrinsic value. That's something I struggle with. Sometimes I worry that I don't, if I don't provide some sort of service or usefulness as a man, whether it's financial or talent or making you laugh in a bad situation or just some sort of transactional thing where you get something from me that is of use to you that I have no intrinsic value beyond that. And that's, a t I think a lot of people struggle with that. Uh, and we all do. You're human beings. You have value because you're alive. You, you beat the clock to be here, man. You know, one in a million chance of even being on this earth and every human being deserves respect and integrity and should be treated as such, but sometimes um, the last person I extend those graces to are myself. <clears throat> That's something I'm working on. Uh, I don't have the money for a midlife crisis, so I got to figure something else out, you know? But I started thinking about those things, about, uh, you know, have I done the things I want to do? Am I heading in the right direction? Have I mended the fences that need fences? I'm having all these heavy thoughts having all these spiritual Chris Christopherson, my guardian angels floating above me. Am I doing the things I want to do with my life? Am I loving the people that deserve to be loved? If I told them that I love them, just having all these thoughts and I get to work Monday morning. It's my birthday. That was the point of the story that I'm getting to. I wanted to give you a little backlog of what was going on before I got there. I'm going to find out that my partner, Get to work. I work on a morning radio show called The Rizzuto Show. If you're watching this show, chances are you're familiar with it. If you're not, <clears throat> it's a morning radio show in St. Louis, Missouri. Great show. Love all my co-hosts. I get to work. I got balloons waiting for me. My co-hosts have bought me balloons. Happy birthday, Rafe. I'm like, that's sweet. That's nice. One of my co-hosts, Lauren Elwell, contacted my mom. She made me my mom's famous taco dip, which I love. I'm a bit of a foodie, but I'm a white trash foodie. I only like bad foods. Now, the taco dip is shaving some years off your life. I'm not going to lie to you. It's like a layer of sour cream and cream cheese mix, taco meat, green peppers, olives, cheese, tomatoes, yum, and then you dip Doritos in it because I'm a piece of trash. I don't know what to tell you. You can take the boy out of the trailer park. You can't take the trailer park out of the boy. I'm like, oh, this is this will cheer me up. Got some taco dip. They're like, that's not all. They get me a present. What's in this? What's in the box? A snakeskin club shirt was in the box. I'm a little baffled by this. I'm like, oh, maybe they're tired of seeing me wear. You know, I, I've chosen. I got about seven or eight pairs of the same gray-ish colored jeans. I got about twenty of these black V-neck shirts you see me in if you're watching live on Spotify or YouTube. I was like, oh, maybe they're just trying to like, put a little color in old Rafe's life. Maybe that's something I need to think about on the back half of my life. Maybe I want to start adding, maybe I want to spice things up with my wardrobe. I don't know. I just spit really far. If you're watching, that was crazy. But I was like, all right. I don't know if snakeskin's the obvious first leap. <laughs> but all right. I'll throw it on, dude. 
I'm a cool guy. So I throw on this snakeskin club shirt. And I'm like, uh, let's see what's happening. I put it on, and then they're like, well, it's actually part of a larger surprise. I go, okay. My partner had arranged for me to take the rest of the day off work and the day, uh, this following day off work. She showed up and said, I got a surprise for you on your birthday, bud. I go, what's that? She goes, I'm taking you to Chicago, Illinois. We're hopping on a flight right now. I go, okay. Wow. You cleared all this with my – she got it all cleared. Now, that's great. Where are we going? She goes, you're going – to the United Center to see a concert. And I say, who, who is it? And she says, it's Charlie XCX. And I said, who's that? And she said, uh, it's an, a DJ artist, Charlie XCX, which I did know. So they got the song about underwear uh, with Billie Eilish. Like, you want to know what color is my underwear i want to know what color is my underwear and i'm like okay why <laughs> uh and she said i don't know i think you're gonna like it i think it's cool i love her i go okay and she's like and i scheduled us a couple's massage at a, a spa in chicago which sounds great um Although I have been on record several occasions that I hate being rubbed by strangers. It is not something I enjoy. I'm not yucking your yum. I don't personally like it. Because you get rubbed down and sometimes the snot gets into my sinuses and then I feel like it's just not a sexy time. Sometimes I feel like I got a cold afterwards. It's just not something that I feel good afterward. I'll take a rub down from my lady. Because, you know, that might end a way I like. I might get it. I might get a happy ending there. I'm just being real. When I flip over at home, I'm hoping it goes there. And if it doesn't, at least I'm at home. And of course, my my friend Riz, who was here earlier, called it out. He said, "So let me get this straight. He's you're making him take paid time off to go to a concert of an artist that you like that he's never heard of." And to get a couple's massage that he's gone on record saying he does not enjoy. And she's like, well, when you say it out loud, it sounds like a bad plan. <laughs> uh, and I was like, no, it sounds great, hon. Uh, have you gathered all of my ex-girlfriends to go to dinner and tell me of my shortcomings in real time while I eat foods I don't enjoy? <laughs> but it's a thought that counts. She tried to plan something for me. I'm pretty easy going, dude. I'm like, all right, let's go make the best of it. They said, did you pack his bag? You guys got to get on a flight in two hours. She goes, no, I woke up late. So we go home. We're run right out of the gate. This is a disaster. Total disaster. But it was a laughable disaster, and it was funny, and it was fun. We go to get on the plane. We're B group boarding on a Southwest flight. We're not rolling in the dough. We're not flying first class, Okay. We go, we get to the airport. We barely make it to the gate on time because she didn't pack. She's like, I'm going to pack everything. You eat some taco dip while I pack. We're going to be awesome. I'm a, I got you. It's your birthday, birthday boy. So I allow it to happen. I don't ask questions. I'm trying to relinquish control because I do a lot of the plan. She was trying to, what she was trying to do was I do a lot of the planning when we go. I fly in this. I fly ready to start a new civilization. When I fly, I am in work boots, jeans, I have a backpack that has the essentials to keep me alive on an island with for at least three days. I welcome the emergency row on a plane, guys. I'm ready to spring into action and lead. That door, look at these guns. Look, these are the last things I have left from a time that I used to work out. But that door's coming off if I'm in the emergency. Are you kidding me? That door's not getting stuck. I'll push it so hard dude we'll it'll be like a jet ski we'll be riding that door across the ocean after a water landing which is just a crash that they gave a fancy name to and i'm ready i'm ready to lead but we go we get to the hotel we open the suitcase <laughs> i said uh i'm gonna take a shower did you bring my bathroom bag she goes um no, I forgot your bathroom bag. I didn't know you. I brought toothpaste. <laughs> I go, okay. 
So I didn't have any, no deodorant, no soap, nothing. I was like, all right, well, I only see one shirt in here. And she's like, oh, I packed you three or four shirts. Like, I only see one. And she's like, oh, yeah, I guess I only got you one. So I had one shirt, no, <laughs> none of my bathroom stuff. She had nine outfits, by the way, to go to this Charlie XCX concert. A blow dryer, a hot curler, four pairs of shoes. I got one shirt, one shirt for two days. And I ended up having to buy a Brat shirt at the Charlie XCX concert because I just needed something to wear home. But I was like, it's fine. I washed with that little stinky hotel soap, whatever. Let's go have a good time. So we get ready. And I'm still at this point, I'm thinking maybe this is a bit, right? Like she's not actually taking me to Charlie XCX. She's going to take me to a concert I like. Willie Nelson's probably in town, I bet. This is all, I'm still trying to figure out the bit here, right? I'm like, that snakeskin shirt. They, she got all my co-hosts to try to sell me this bullshit. There's no way she's taking me to a concert I have no interest in going in. Wrong. Wrong. We get to the United Center, and let me tell you something. It was by far uh, the gayest event I've ever seen, and I don't have any problem with that at all. But it was just a very gay event. And I've been to two New York City Pride Parades, two. Not even half as gay as this Charlie XCX concert was. Because she had an opener named Troy Sivan, who's huge in that community. I've never heard of him. Very talented guy. Great singer. But the, the gay community was out. Chicago's Boys Town was empty for a night. I'm here to tell you, folks. You, you were getting a drink in Boys Town. There was zero wait time. Because every twink in the Chicagoland area was at Charlie XCX. And that's great. So I'm like, this is going to be a good time. I've never been around this many gays and not had a good time. I'm seeing dude, everyone's comfortable in their own skin. I didn't know that the whale tail was back. You guys remember whale tails when they let their little G string underwear hang out of the back of their pants in the late nineties, early aughts. It's back and it ain't just for ladies no more. Dudes, too. That's a quality that I can get behind. A lot of whale tales happening. Didn't know who they belonged to. Find out that my girlfriend has sprung for the VIP experience for me to go to Charlie XCX. We arrived late. We missed an hour of the hour and a half VIP experience. So we had to get in really late. We get two drinks. There's some chicken fingers. There's a little bit of charcuterie. I don't know how much extra she paid. We get a couple Charlie XCX water bottles and a hat that says sweat on it. Sweat. Wow. VIP, 350 bucks a ticket, she tells me. And I'm like, good God, woman. We paid $700 for chicken fingers. So you better believe, let me tell you something. <laughs> when I tell you I ate an obnoxiously large plate of chicken fingers, guys, I'm not fucking around here, okay? I was like, I tell me how much this cost because I don't drink. We got one free. She did a shot and a drink, and I was like, the, then it was cash bar. I'm about to fuck up $300 worth of chicken fingers. I turned into Joey Chestnut in this VIP experience. I'm slamming chicken fingers, dude. I'm running a train on them chicken fingers, brother. Honey mustard, just slopping it up. I was being liberal with the honey mustard, dude. I was like Bernie Sanders with that honey mustard, dude. I was giving, I wanted free honey mustard for everybody. I was Bernie, Bernie 2012. <laughs> Had a great time. I'm still having fun. I'm like, whatever, dude. Took a picture in front of Michael Jordan's statue. I'm like, this is nothing else. It's hilarious. I'm sure the concert's going to be great. Wrong. Concert sucked. We get good seats, VIP seats. We get there. It's just a big, long stage. They got like a a backdrop of what looks like a New York City building or like a Chicago building scaffolding, kind of like the, the the movie Chicago. And I'm like, oh, they're going to do something cool with that. And I know that it's like a club mix. I'm like, there'll probably be people dancing. It's going to be a crazy light show, whatever. It may not be my style of music, but I'm, I'm going to make the best of it. She loves it. I love her. If she's having a good time, there's value in that, right? Well, we get to our seats and the guy sitting beside me is big old, just a giant guy, just a big fat guy. I don't know how else to say it. I'm a fat guy. 
I'm not trying to fat shame nobody. This guy was a very stinky man. Uh, it was a mixture of sour milk and um, when you leave your clothes in the washer too long and then you just go ahead and dry them anyway. But then they got that like mildewy smell. So it was like mildew with sour milk and then some BO on top. And I honestly gagged at least 15, 20 times during this concert because the more he sweated, the more that smell emanated from him. And our whole section was feeling it. It wasn't just me. I looked around and I could see people being like, oh my God. I could see, you know, these people were upset. I didn't want to shame him. So I didn't say nothing. I'm like, he's here. He's having a good time. He's by himself. I could see why. Wouldn't want to ride in a car with that. My girlfriend, Tina's like, oh my gosh, this is, oh, it stinks. You want me to trade places? Like, I don't think moving one seat over, I'm not going to torture you. Like, that makes me feel worse. So I'll just smell this sour milk fella here. <laughs> and I'm in my snakeskin shirt, guys, at Charlie XCX concert. It's 15-year-old girls in every twink in Boys Town. I look like an undercover cop. Nobody wanted to hang out with me, okay? I looked like a dad or a stepdad who was there to keep an eye on his stepdaughter because his his new wife made him go. Like, you go down there and you make sure Bridget's not getting hit on. And I'm like, I trust me, there was no one at that concert to hit on her. No one was interested. Your 15-year-old daughter has never been safer. So then we're hanging out, and I'm like, at least, yeah, 46 Jump Street, someone said in the chat. That's exactly what it was, dude. I was <laughs> Chan Channing Tater Tot. In 40, 46 Jump Street. All right. So anyway, this goes on. Whatever. Having a good time still. We go to... <laughs> we go to... Uh, concert begins, right? She has some opener. Plays a couple songs. I'm good. This Troy guy comes out. Let's look this Troy guy up. I want you guys to get a little... Troy Savan. Australian singer, songwriter, and actor. Beautiful little twink guy. Beautiful guy. He's coming out. Nips out. He's got backup dancers. Let's see if I can find us a little Troy Savon on YouTube here. This is what... Okay. A little, a little Troy Savon for you. A couple of these guys were his backup dancers. I recognize them. This is Troy. He's got on crotchless pants. Great singer. Having a good time. Some guys jumping on a trampoline, smoking uh, weed out of a banana. A little bit of a uh, metaphor there. Somebody showing their little booty. I don't know what the rules are about that on YouTube, but it's on here, so. I'll just, I'll just pick random spots through this video to show you. I feel the, not good song. Nothing wrong with it. But uh, just wanted to get you get you an idea. Here we go. He's lighting his ween on fire with some kind of lighter here in the video. For those of you listening, now he's doing a keg stand, and he did this keg stand during the show. I would like to add. I'm going to let me freeze frame on that. Nothing wrong with that. I can get behind a keg stand. I had my college days, but there was a uh, you know. A lot of guys running around with their butts out, covering their little weens up. And that's totally fine. I got no problem with that. I got no issues with that. I feel the rush. I like the song. But I was unfamiliar with Troy Sivan. So <coughs> he comes out. And uh, uh oh, I got to do this. Sorry, sorry, guys. We'll cut this out of the. <laughs> Excuse me. So I'm unfamiliar with Troy. We're, we're start the concert. Now I'm next to the stinky guy. Concert started. I got a belly full of chicken fingers, guys. I'm sitting on about 175 chicken fingers and a gallon of honey mustard because I'm getting my money out of the United Center. And I'm like, at least it's going to be a good show. I don't know what happened. And I'm not disrespecting. Charlie XCX is a great artists i would never shit on another artist i hate when people do that but what i'll tell you is i feel like they got famous so fast 
I kind of they've been doing it a while, but they got really big with this brat summer thing. I thought it was brat summer. So, and there were no bratwursts at this show. I'd like to tell you, I did walk all the way around the entire United Center. And I'm like, not a single bratwurst at a brat show. That's in Chicago. That's fucked up. If there was ever going to be a brat at a Charlie XCX concert, Chicago is the city that should have delivered the goods on that. And I stand by that. I wouldn't have had to eat chicken fingers. There should have been nothing but brats. I mean, the tie-in, are you kidding me? The whole fucking VIP thing should have just been, I should have been able to ride a giant brat in there. Like a little one of those rocking horses. They did have a blow-up mattress with an, uh, some sort of aluminum foil blanket on it. it. Looked like one of those solar blankets you give someone after a car crash for you to lay on and take pictures. It didn't feel that VIP to me. That's my point. So the show starts, we're having, we're, we're trying to make the best of it. I got this big stinky fellow, Shrek sitting beside me, you know, just smelling like a swamp ogre. That's fine. Everybody smells different. But if you're going to the United Center, put on a couple squirts of Dracar Noir. That's all I'm saying. Throw a little something on it. Throw a little something on it, dude. Just some, I'll take some Axe body spray. I really would. Well, Troy starts playing and Troy's. They're taking turns. Now, Troy's got a few backup dancers, but for the most part, the stage is bare. The way it felt to me was this show was in a 40,000-seat arena. It would have been a good show in front of about 800 to 1,000 people. They just The show hadn't caught up with the size of the audience. Like When you go to something like that, the, lights, the strobe lights weren't that great. There was, just wasn't a whole lot going on. There was no musicians. There was no turntables. They were lip-syncing a lot. I'd say 60% of the show was lip-synced. And that was not even close. Like they were, they were dancing and trying to like sell the stuff and the microphone would be far away from their face and they'd still be singing. Their mouth wouldn't be moving. There's, and they didn't have any kind of, the only thing they projected up on the big screens for people in the nosebleeds was there was a guy with like a steady cam that would come out on stage and it would just be like them singing to the camera like I am right now, like put this camera on me. This was what you'd see. I feel the rush, and I feel the rush. And can you smell the colors of my underwear? That's all it was. And that was fine. But I was like, no, nothing trippy, no graphics. You didn't design like a cool. You know, it just felt like the tech or the production of the show was pretty underwhelming. Even my girlfriend who loves them said they felt like they didn't do themselves justice as an artist. She's like, I learned a valuable lesson. This music's better for in the car or cleaning the kitchen than it is to come see it live. Because Charlie XCX just kind of came out with a, a wireless mic, no backup dancers, and she was kicking ass, man, selling the bit, doing costume changes and stuff. It just like I felt like the stage was huge, and it wasn't being filled with much. And I could see disappointment. I could see disappointment across... Not, I had no skin in the game. She was like, I feel like you're having a bad time. I'm like, honey, I came here with zero expectations. It can't go anywhere but up for me. I didn't want to be here to begin with. I woke up at 4 a.m. You put me on a flight I didn't know I was getting on. I don't have deodorant. This guy doesn't either, apparently. Could have used it. I would have loaned it to that guy. I'm watching music. I don't know a single song. I don't know what's going on. I see, but there wasn't a lot of dancing going on. I've never seen this many gay people and no dancing. It was crazy because there was just like not, everyone was packed in like sardines. There was no turntables. Like we, she thought there was going to be like, oh, this, she's going to DJ and remix all her songs. It's going to be like we're at Burning Man. It wasn't like that at all. It was backing tracks and lip syncing. It was a glorified karaoke show. And I hate saying that. Still cool. And if you like the music, you probably loved it. There's going to be people that disagree with me that say it was a great show. And that's fine. I don't care. It wasn't. And there was a moment, you know, I'm sitting there and I'm still, now I, I'm setting the table for you here. This is all happening on the heels of me coming into work that morning, reflecting on my hero, Chris Christopherson, and the value his art brought to the world and his character and the substance of the things he was making. And uh, there was a point during one of Troy's songs that one of his backup shirtless backup dancers took the microphone uh, and he presented it. I'm just going to show you guys, like, if this is the microphone, he presented it as if it were. I don't know if you 
can see this now. He just presented it, uh, you know, from his crotch as if it were his penis. And Troy got, took his shirt off and got down on both knees and put his hand behind his back and assumed the position as if he was going to kiss this microphone penis. And he started singing a song about something about booty holes or something like that. I, I don't know. I, I didn't know the song. <clears throat> Great song. But I couldn't help let my mind wander a little bit in that moment and wonder, like, what if Chris Christopherson in that moment was up in heaven? And he's talking to the other two highwaymen, Johnny Cash, Willie Nelson, or excuse me, Waylon Jennings. Chris Christopherson's in heaven on a cloud. Waylon Jennings, Johnny Cash, they're all talking. He goes, boys, it's nice to see you again. It really is, you know. And uh, But I got to tell you, I've been thinking about how my fans might be reacting. I'm sure this hit a lot of people hard down there. And I know one of our number one fans, he's been a proponent of ours for a long time, this guy named Rafe. And it's his birthday. And I died on his birthday weekend. And I bet that's hitting him hard. He's probably sitting at home. God, I hope he didn't relapse. You know, he's been in recovery. He's been doing so good. But... Hope he's not like drinking a bottle of whiskey, listening to a bunch of old country because he couldn't handle his heroes passing away. So if you guys don't mind, I'd just like to check in and see what our boy's up to since he was one of my number one fans. So let's let's peek through this cloud right here and just see what old Rafe, what the fuck is going on down there? <laughs> oh my God. Chris Christopherson just peeks in on me at that moment while this guy's on stage singing into another guy's penis. And he's like, uh, Waylon, cover your eyes. Johnny, don't look. Johnny Cash is puking in the corner. I don't know. There's nothing wrong with it. I'm not shaming anybody. I'm just saying there's humor in the juxtaposition of that whole event, of that whole day, the, the, the range of emotions that went through my head that day. Like what you like. I didn't hate it. I liked the music. I've been listening to a few of the songs. I just didn't like the concert. I just didn't think it was good. That was the most that happened in the concert. That guy ended up getting on a pedestal that kind of raised up a little bit right at the end, but there was, wasn't much going on on stage. Even my girlfriend was disappointed. She's like, I didn't feel like it was a great show. And as we were leaving... Some young 20-year-old girls made fun of her outfit and really ruined her night. <clears throat> she got her first taste of being older, which was, you know, maybe a little poetic justice. She was worried, you know. She's like, hey, I feel like, you know, should I not plan this trip? Was this a bad idea? And I go, I, I don't know, honey. It's, it feels like you planned your perfect birthday. And, yeah, was there a moment that I had to be like, is this a giant red flag? Am I dating a wild narcissist? Of course. Yes, but I'm not. She just did something sweet. It was her first try trying to do something nice for me. And I chose to look at it that way where I was like, you know what? At least you made the effort. You flew me up here. You didn't bring any of my stuff, but you flew me up here. You got me here. Did we get to the airport late and have to sit in separate seats across the aisle? Yeah, we did. Did we lose our boarding and end up being the last ones on the plane because you didn't put a tag on your bag, even though the lady told you to three times? Yeah, we did. And it happened. That happened. Still love you. Still appreciate you. I'm an easygoing fella. So after Chris Christopherson, Johnny Cass, and Waylon Jennings all checked in from the cloud to see me watching this show, I uh, show ended. We go back to the hotel. We're going to wake up the next day, go to a spa, get a couple's massage. We go in. Nice place. You got like a saltwater float. It's down in like the catacombs, cat the, uh, the underbelly of Chicago. It felt very eyes wide shut down there. But nice. Smelled good. You go to get our couple's massage. I go in the men's room. I undress. I get in a robe. I'm already not loving that. Just in my, you know, swim trunks and a robe. I come down. Some other guy's there. It's his wife's birthday. He's there with her. I'm sitting over by this other reluctant husband. The gals come down together. And they check in together. And something got messed up during the check-in, so the lady thought the two gals were the couple. And I go to my couple's massage, and there's a gal, and there's a guy named John. 
John's a very big, burly, flamboyantly gay man. Excellent masseuse, by the way. He looks as surprised to see me as I am to see him. And he's like, are you Megan? <laughs> no, sir, I am not Megan. And he's like, I had Megan? Megan Jones? And I'm like, and definitely not Megan Jones. Tina's in panic mode. She's like, I know it should be Rafe Williams. He's like, I'm sorry, I've never had this happen before, but the person I'm supposed to be massaging is not the person that's in my room. And then, so it just becomes a thing. He seems like he doesn't want me there. I'm not loving the idea, not because of anything homophobic. I don't care. I don't want to be rubbed down by a stranger to begin with. The thing that and we had an opportunity, he's like, well, I guess we'll just go ahead and do it. You guys are both scheduled for an hour, so it doesn't matter. Just you guys decide which one of us you want. Now I'm in the room. I'm assuming she signed us up for this. She could have said, you usually get to say preference man or woman. Now, I would prefer a woman based on the fact that when a woman rubs me down, it does feel rejuvenating, nurturing, like I'm being pampered. When a man rubs me down, it feels like I'm in physical therapy. That's the only thing I'm trying to stand on here. Okay? It's not latent uh, homophobic shit at all. I love the gays. Big proponent for the gays. Be as gay as you want. We're all a little gay. We're all a little gay. I just thought it'd be more relaxing to get rubbed down by a set of little small hands, like a raccoon's like back there, you know, rummaging around on me, needing me like a little cat. Not oh, coming in and just really giving it to me. I was wrong. I needed John's strong hands, and I didn't know it yet. But we'll get there. He seems reluctant. I go to Tina. I go, hey, you pick whichever masseuse you want. Thinking she'd be like, I get what's going on here. I'll pick John. And then he doesn't look like a bad guy. He gets a little woman raccoon rubbed down. She immediately sells me out and goes, I'll go with her. <laughs> Thanks, honey. So now it's me and John eyeball to eyeball. We're in separate rooms. There's nothing couples massage you about it. I was very isolated. A lot of music going. Like a lot of like uh, sitar type music. And there's candles everywhere. It's dark. It's very romantic. But it's just me and John. John says, take your pants off and slide in between these sheets. And I'll come back in in a minute. So I take my swim trunks off. Now I got my, you know, schwans out. I'm laying face down in a donut hole between two sheets. He comes in. Great guy. Very professional. He Now he's got a problem. He seems upset. He goes, I was told this, this massage is only going to be 45 minutes. I had you down for an hour. Now it's now now she's saying 45 minutes. I go, who's she? She's like, you, you know, Tina, the, your girlfriend. And I go, what's going on? And I, from the other room, I just hear her yell, I made a manic decision. I made a manic decision. And I go, what is going on? She's like, I decided 45 minutes so we'd have more time in the spa. And I was like, okay. So now this guy thinks I didn't want, I know he thinks I didn't want the rub down. And then the thing is, is, that's the other thing is like, now I'm, now that's in my head. So now he's like, what, what do you want to work on? Where do you hurt at? And I'm just like, you know, lower back and feet, you know, I'm trying to keep him kind of placated where I'm like, Hey man, let's just do this. It's whatever she wants to do. But the thing is, is now I'm getting a rub down. And normally if it was a masseuse and I didn't feel like there was this, and now I'm in my head, like if I say anything about not wanting, like, hey, man, don't rub near my balls, then I come off homophobic. So now everything's on the table. I don't know where this guy's hands are going to go. I'm trying to relax, you know, have a good time. I don't really want my ass rubbed by anybody. That's a danger zone. That's my, that's my area, okay? That's my little treasure box. He starts rubbing me down, dude, manhandling me. Didn't bother me at all. There was a couple times where he was squirting the oil. He's like, I'm going to be using nut oil. Do you have a nut allergy? And I'm like, just say say pine nut or something, man. Rephrase that. And he squirts the oil in it, like <laughs> squirted like ketchup that needed to come out. And then like the oil hit me raw dog on the back. That bothered me a little. That bothers me with anyone. This is why I don't like public massages from strangers. John gets in there, dude. He's rubbing. I'm still sore today. John is rubbing me so good. He's popping my hips in and out of socket back there. 
he's rubbing my ass cheeks like he's like like he was salting them to go in the oven and it felt great i'm not gonna lie to you and he's popping me and he's locking me didn't bother me at all but he roughed me up pretty good and you know that's the thing about getting a rub down it's like i said i just felt like i had to feel like i was in physical therapy like for me to enjoy it i had to be like okay here's the scenario i had to make up you guys ever do this let me ask you be honest you ever i had to disassociate a little bit right and not because and because the thing was i'm like i don't want to say anything to the guy i'm just gonna let him do his thing because i don't want to come off i don't want him to be uncomfortable maybe that's not fair he's a professional i should be able to say hey man stay away from my ass and my, my don't pop my hips in and out of socket and be yanking on my legs and stuff but i didn't i didn't say anything I just disassociated. And so for me to enjoy this experience, this, I don't know if you guys ever do this. Do you ever get into a situation where you're like, I am going to make up a scenario in my head that is going to help me get through this. And I don't know if you guys have ever seen the Vinny Pazienza story where he gets paralyzed as a prize fighter and the doctor comes in and he's like, he's in headgear. And he's got like his halo headgear on and the doctor's like, Mr. Pazienza, you're you're probably never going to walk again. And he just goes, you're wrong, Dr. Cotty. <laughs> I am going to walk again. And I'm going to fight again, too. And you're like, well, I don't think you're going to fight Vinny Pazienza, but I'd be damned. He did. He learned to walk again. He learned to fight. He got back in the boxing ring. He was paralyzed from, like, the chest down at this point. So... See if I can find uh, Vinny Pazienza. Tear in his eye, I could tell he felt for me. And he said, "Son, I'm sorry to say you're not gonna box again." And I looked at him. I said, "No, Doctor Cotty, you're wrong. I am gonna box again." You see, you don't understand what kind of man I am. This is Vinny Pazienza training after having a broken neck. Right, so little backstory. This is the scenario I created in my head. I am laying face down in a donut, and I'm like, "You are a world champion fighter who has been paralyzed, and this man is here to help you walk again. And all the stuff he's doing to your body is so you can get back in the ring and win the title." And dude, I had a fucking blast because then once I created this scenario for myself. It was freeing, dude. I was just like, yeah, I am going to get back in shape. I am. Yeah, I am going to get back in the ring like George Foreman at 46 years old. I created a totally fake career for myself that I, where I was a championship level fighter. And this guy was just by giving me PT because I didn't know how else to handle being massaged by a stranger. And man, it felt great. He got so deep into some of my muscles. I'm, I'm still very sore today. And I thank John for his loving hands. It was called the Air Spa, A-I-R-E, in Chicago, Illinois. If you got a chance, go, because it's great. And then we spent time in the spa, and that was fine. There was like a lavender sauna and a peppermint sauna and a, and a, and a like cold plunge, you get in these hot baths and do a cold plunge, all that felt great. And it was just me and Tina, we did that on our own. That was great. Then we're going to go to dinner. The third thing she'd put on the itinerary was a nice Italian dinner. Daddy loves Italian. In Little Italy in Chicago, which doesn't exist, but I didn't have the heart to tell her that. And she got the advice from a friend of ours. Now, I love my friend Steve. He's a good dude, but he's an eclectic dude. Now, she got the advice to go to this Italian dinner uh, <laughs> this is the same guy that took me to a Russian bathhouse because he said they had the best chicken soup in the city. So this is who we're taking our dinner advice from, okay? She's like, I have your friends here in Chicago. I have some friends that live up there. And she's like, we're going to meet out and we're going to have dinner. Well, she forgot to confirm with all my friends, so they were all at work. So nobody came. She's like, this place is called uh, D'Amato's, and Steve recommended it. He says, it's great. It's great. You're going to love it. Now, I'm wearing... The second gift I was gifted that I left out earlier was I was given a, a completely cherry red velour tracksuit. 
for me to wear to the spa. So I'm wearing a velour track suit with a Charlie XCX Brat shirt on underneath it, walking through the streets of Chicago. We walk a mile to this D'Amato's place. We got to get on a plane in like three hours, and it's supposed to be like my big birthday dinner. And we get there, and Steve has sent us to a deli that has no seats. It's like a little tiny deli where people are just yelling at each other like the bear before it became the bear, when it was just a stinky sandwich place. And they're like, one chicken palm, one tortellini soup. Ma, ma, give me a chicken palm. <laughs> like, it was nothing relaxing. I'm like, where are we going to eat this at? We have to take it back to the hotel. So we got two chicken farms. It, they forgot our food. It took like 40 minutes. We get in the hotel. We drive back to the hotel on an Uber. We get to the hotel room. The Uber driver's like, you need to leave for the airport like in 3.30 if you want to make your 5.30 flight. It's going to be fucking nuts. Mid so we have like 15 minutes to eat and pack. And these chicken parms are so wet at this point because that was what they were famous for, were these vodka chicken parm sandwiches. And she was upset. And I go, hey, let's just get a cannoli. Let's get some chicken parms. Let's make the best of it, you know? These things are disgusting. We ended up throwing them in the trash because they were just sopping wet. She's upset. I can tell. She feels like this trip laid an egg. And it did. Don't get me wrong. But I didn't care. The point of this entire story, besides to tell you how disastrously horrible it was, is that it didn't matter because it was a fun adventure. And I realized... Even though it wasn't the adventure I wanted by any stretch of the imagination, it was a terrible adventure. But it was still a reminder that even though I was feeling all these ways about being 46 and like my life's half over and all this stuff, like I didn't wake up in that morning and think that I was going to be at it. If you'd have told me, I would have, to quote Christmas Vacation, I would have been more shocked Less shocked if I woke up with my head stapled to the carpet than if you told me I was going to a Charlie XCX Troy Sivan concert the night of my birthday to get a couple's massage that I hate the next day and then to eat a sloppy, disgusting chicken parm sandwich for my birthday. But that's what happened. And it was fun. It was funny. And funny always wins for me. I had a great time. It was an adventure that I really, really needed and I realized I still have that part of myself that's like, oh, man, you're an easygoing guy, and you like to have fun. And Tina even said that. She goes, I love you so much. I really appreciate. She's like, you haven't complained once. You've just tried to make the best of every situation. And, you know, you made me feel like even though she's like, we both know this is a total disaster, but you haven't made me feel like a piece of shit about it. And I'm like, yeah, that's life, man. Life, that is what life is. Your best laid plans often go awry. And it just reminded me that I have a whole bunch of life. Yeah, half of it is over. But I still got a whole long stretch of runway in front of me to do cool stuff. And sitting around and dwelling on that kind of shit, it's not helpful. It's not going to change anything. So my midlife crisis, my existential crisis was very short. And I think it just got, I think the trip to Chicago may have short-circuited uh, whatever was happening in my brain that had me feeling like, oh man, life is, life is half gone. The, I'm closer to 50 than 40. What does that mean for me as a man? Will my penis even work tomorrow? I don't know. I don't know the rules of physiology. I'm not a doctor. I'm a captain. But the point is that even though it was a, Terrible birthday. Still in the top 40 birthdays. I don't remember the first four, and I had the flu for one. So still made the top 40, number 40, but still top 40. And the thing I need, my yeah, my midlife crisis. Somebody in the chat said, race midlife crisis Netflix special will be titled One Night in Chicago, and that might be true. That might be 100% true. Uh, what the point is, and I'll end on this. We'll go to the next segment. As if you're out there and you're feeling that way, yes, it's okay to embrace the darkness within you um, and to ask those tough questions. 
of like, you know, have I done enough? Have I shown enough character? Have I loved the people that need to be loved? Yeah, man. Have all those. It's good to have those conversations with yourself. Hold yourself accountable. Go to therapy. Talk about those things. Have I uh, amended the fences? Have I resolved relationships need to be resolved? Have I been willing to take an honest look at myself and say, here's some of my shortcomings that I need to work on? That's the hardest thing in the world to do, but not, not so much that you hate yourself. And that's something I struggle with. But this trip, if nothing else, it made me step outside of myself and view it from the 20,000-foot view of how comically terrible and I had a good time. I had a good time in a bad situation. And I was like, there's going to be so many more good situations after this. So what am I even fucking worried about? Everybody dies. It's inevitable. It doesn't matter how you die. You can die on the shitter. You can die in a plane crash. You can die in your sleep. You can die getting hit by a bus. You can die of uh, tachycardia. It ends for everybody. What matters is how you lived. And as long as you're having a good time and you find ways to enjoy yourself in bad situations, I think that's a life well lived. And that's the point of that story in my birthday. And that concludes a segment I like to call The Annals of History. We'll be back after a quick break with a word from our sponsors, Father Time, The Grim Reaper, and 18 North Central. And we're back. Welcome back to the number two show with Rife Williams. It's good to be here. Uh, if you want to call in, we're going to get into a section I like to call Tank Talks. Thank you very much for calling. It's the hotline, Papa Squat Hotline. Oh, didn't know we were coming back live just then. That was a total recording. I was in the studio for 50 hours putting that little jingle together. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you want to call in, 818-532-1420, 818-532-1420. Talk about your own existential crisis after I just laid mine out for you. Um, call in. It's a segment I like to call Tank Talks. I'm going to read some emails. I'm going to listen to some messages that you guys uh messages that you guys have left me and we're going to talk about all kinds of stuff. I'm going to make this a little quick segment because that middle segment took a while, but it is what it is, baby. So right now, if you want to call, it's 818-532-1420. I hope to hear from you soon. Let me look and make sure no one's calling in. Mine's down. Over here, Zane. So just let me know if somebody calls because my little screener thing went down, brother. Number two show screener is down. It's down. Well, let's see what I got for messages. Let's listen to one. I know there's one I want to listen to. This is called. It better not be this. I haven't listened to it yet. I don't like the title. It's going to piss me the fuck off if it. I just told you about one of my heroes. Another hero of mine, as we all know, is Reba McIntyre. Fancy. Country music's queen. Little red-headed ginger. Ooh. Yeah. Her and Cheryl Bernard, man. She's got the fire, the fire on her on her head can melt it. Melt the ice of all the ice caps. This is simply titled Reba McIntyre Hater MP3. Let's listen to it. Hey, Ray. Listen to you every morning on the number one show. Uh, have heard you do Reba McIntyre fancy mm -hmm. when you were doing the fundraiser or Donnie was doing the fundraiser. Mm -hmm. uh, quick question. Don't want to offend you because we're all entitled to our own opinions. But when did Reba mail it in? I mean, at least at fancy, she is kind of enunciating words and singing but uh, we turn it on a country station after we're done with the number one show, and every Reba song we've heard lately is there's just music in the background, <laughs> and then she just, like, talks for three and a half minutes. Uh, just wanted to get your input on it. Keep up the good work. Hmm. Well, eat a dick, my friend. Um, sorry, that was lashing out. That's not cool. Let's try to give this asinine and insane indictment 
Let's let's drag it out into the light. You think? <laughs> Woo! You think? What's this fucking guy's name? Did he leave his name? Yeah, I bet he was anonymous. I bet you were anonymous, my friend. Coming at me off of my birthday week. Chris Christopherson died, and you're going to leave me a message about Reba McIntyre phoning it in, dude? She has a new sitcom coming out, bruh. Phoning it in. What? What? The fuck are you talking about, man? Oh, let me tell you something, bro. You aren't fit to breathe the same air as Reba McIntyre, my friend. You criticize the blanket of smooth country ballad she provides and then question the manner in which she provides it? <laughs> you can't handle the Reba. But I'm going to try to give this asinine theory of yours some credibility. Let's look up. Yeah, it's going to get me flagged and demonetize the whole goddamn podcast, but I'm still going to do it. You know why? Because I don't do it for the money. I do it for the people, the listeners. and You guys deserve it. I'm going to trace that call, dude. I've never wanted to trace a call more in my life. I never wish we had the technology. I wish there was a point van with two little DJs in it two little alternative DJs with spiky hair and like puka shell necklaces on listening to some 41 that I could just call down and be like, Hey, turn that some 41 song off. I finally got a fucking job for you two losers. I need you to tap into the number two show Papa squad hotline. I need you to trace this call called Reba McIntyre hater MP3. I need you to trace this number. I need to know who's making these accusations. I need to know if they're working alone. Are they part of some sort of syndicate trying to bring Reba down because I won't stand for it, brother. I'll throw myself in front of Reba McIntyre, dude. It is my dream. I had a fucking dream. This is a true story. And I think it's manifested. But we'll see. I sang Reba McIntyre's Fancy at the last Riz Show Live event we did in a red dress and a wig. Okay? And the music didn't come on. Something got fucked up. The music didn't. Something was messed up. And a good friend of ours that used to be on the number one show, his name is Jeff Burton. Those of you that do know him, know he's a cool dude. I love that guy. He's one of the people that I replaced on the show because they had, you know, the show had to move on. And I love that dude. I can never replace him. I can always only hope to do my part on the show. My friend Learn and I always say we each fill one shoe of Jeff Burton. And that's all our, our goal is. And when I talked to his wife, Julie, she gave me the blessing. She said, Jeff loved you. Would love love that you're sitting in that chair and cracking jokes and being a pervert on his behalf. Because he was a perverted guy, just like me. Song didn't come on. I'm standing there in a Reba McIntyre wig. I'm wearing a size 26W red satin dress. Most men can't tell you their dress size, but I can. I'm sitting there in a ruby red dancing dress. Mama washed and combed and curled my hair, and she painted my eyes and lips. And I stepped into that 26W satin dress with a split in the side cleaned up to my hips. And I went out there in a full wig and makeup, and I had two backup dancers who were also dan dressed exactly like me in red satin, and we were called Threba McIntyre, dude. Threba McIntyre. Now, I have that footage somewhere, and... I'm going to find it and put it in this goddamn episode. I don't have it handy, but I thought of it. If I'd have known this blasphemy was going to happen, you best believe I'd have it on me. Do we have it? I would love for her to see that. Then I went out there with two professional dancers. We did. We sang fancy. The music didn't come on right away. Everyone's like, oh, my God, this is supposed to be the finale of the show. This is going to go tits up. This is bad. And I said... Into the microphone, Jeff Burton, I know you're here. I need this music to come on right now. Now would be a good time. And I no sooner got time out of my mouth than somehow Spotify loaded and the fucking music came on. 
And I sang the entire song while everybody danced behind me with my two dancers, a.k.a. Reba McIntyre. And you have the audacity to call into my show and say disparaging comments about the fiery redheaded queen of country music. Well, my friend, that's insane. I've also had a dream. That's what I was getting to. I had a dream that I was on some sort of uh, celebrity show. I don't know the ones where the people sing. Not the mass singer, but something like that. <laughs> In my big finale, I was singing Fancy, Reba McIntyre Fancy, and I came out in a red dress and, and a wig and did the whole thing for comedy's sake, right? And there's a part, this is how vivid the dream was. This is how much I love Reba McIntyre, dude. I think I'm manifesting this in my dreams. There was a part during the song where the lyrics say, she's talking about her mom, and she said, she handed me a heart-shaped locket that said, to thine own self be true. And in that part, I stepped into a giant life-size heart-shaped locket, and it closed up to my neck. So just my head is sticking out like Harry Houdini, like I'm doing some kind of magic trick, okay? The next line is like, it said, to thine own self be true. And I shivered as I watched the roads crawl across the toe of my high heel shoe. And it sounded like somebody else was talking, asking, Mama, what do I do? Lock it opens. Mama, what do I do? Lock it opens. I walk out of the locket. I turn around. Reba McIntyre is strapped to my back, dude. Strapped to my back in like one of those little baby papooses. And it's the real Reba McIntyre. And she sings to the audience, just be nice to the gentleman, fancy. They'll be nice to you. And we brought the fucking house down, dude. At this, I don't know what show it was, but it felt so real to me and so vivid. And I had a little Reba McIntyre on my back, like Master Blaster from Mad Max Thunderdome, dude. I had a little tiny Reba on my big ass fat back. And she was singing and I was singing and we were taking turns. And then she had a little, she popped off of me, pulled some kind of Reba ripcord, popped off of me, hit the floor. We finished the song together. We hit the crescendo. There's a fucking key change. We get into the thing where it's like, uh, I don't remember all the lyrics, but I know that it's like, uh, the part where uh, she starts singing about like, an occasional aristocrat. I got me a Georgia mansion and I'm doing it New York townhouse plan. Yeah, ain't done bad. We were doing that and the, like, dude, we won the whole thing. We won the whole thing. And yeah, it was a dream. Or was it a premonition? This whole birthday experience I had last week. I believe in that shit, man. Sometimes you dream stuff. I was just talking to my friend. Now, granted, I've been talking to my Wiccan friend, Learn a lot. Her little Wiccan tentacles might be getting into me. But she's woke up a part of me that is a little more, a little more open to the idea of magic in my life. And I'm like, maybe it was just a dream. Or maybe dreams. You ever had a dream that you think's deja vu? Because you just like, you'd be talking to a friend. You're like, hey, I've had this moment before. I remember dreaming this six months ago. Maybe that's what's going to happen with me and Reba, dude. And all of these Reba experiences have just been preparing me for that. I sung it live on Donnie's telethon. Then I did it live in a theater in front of 2,000 people. I just gave a little tidbit here on this one, on this show. Now that I've told you all that, I'm going to entertain your stupid fucking theory that she's phoning it in. Despite the fact that everything I said speaks to the contrary, let's find a recent Reba song and we'll see if you're just calling, if you're just trolling me and trying to start some static or if your theory has any kind of credibility. I'm demonetizing my whole platform right now of this shit. 
Reba on a mountaintop, dude. I've got the thunder in my bones. I got the trouble in my soul. Drowning in tears, my eyes were too proud to cry out. Are you fucking kidding me, dude? At my door, but I can't open it no more. Cause his heart's half full of rain and rising high. Woo! Sometimes all the children. It's got kind of a Troy Savan feel to it, doesn't it? I can't roll you across right now. I can't roll you across right now. I'm too busy building a bridge. Woo! I can't throw you a line right now. I can't throw you a line right now. I'm too busy trying to live. Well, I've been a fool for holding on. Look at this queen, dude. She is the Stevie Dicks of country music, dude. Look at this little. You ever seen Tremors? Dude. She sounds great. Got her big belt buckle on. Yeah, she was about to get into I'm only skipping because I know she's gonna hit a bridge where she goes fucking bananas in this song we're getting there You guys can't see my producer, but he's tapping his foot and swaying back and forth. This is 24-year-old kid. This music isn't even for him. That's the Reba effect, dude. That's the Reba effect, dude. That's a Reba flexion. He's settling. Zane's having a Reba flexion off camera. Yeah, she's freezing water droplets like the Matrix right now in this video, dude. This is fucking crazy good. Sing it, girl. Don't do it. Bye bye. That's what I'm saying to this fucking message. Hey, you're a dumbass, dude. Bye bye. You owe Reba a fucking apology, dude. I'd better have a message. <laughs> I'm so fucking mad right now, dude. Let me tell you something, man. You got my sh my cockles up over this fucking message. I like how you snuck it in here too and didn't let me screen it to get my real reaction. This is the flowers on this guy's grave. my god I should have a segment just dedicated to Reba McIntyre on this show and I probably will well I think that was all the definitive proof we needed that this guy is a fucking idiot and listen man maybe you're fucking with me or maybe you're a tone deaf troll who doesn't understand uh, an angel's voice when you hear it, you know, I don't know. I don't know you. You didn't leave your name wise move. I Wish I had that van. I wish I had that some 41 point van some Middle-aged guy who still has blue spiky got to be glued hair down there hanging on to the 90s hanging on to the early aughts just listening to stained Listening to <laughs> Aaron Lewis and Stained, maybe a little Slipknot, just waiting for me to call down to the van and trace this fucking call, dude, and then drive me across the country so I could slap the taste out of your mouth for disrespecting the queen of all country music. Her and Dolly, they sit on dual thrones. Oh, man, you got me fucking wired tight right now, dude. I just was talking about enjoying life. This is the thing, man. Thank God I am here to defend Reba McIntyre, 
my queen. Somebody come pick me up. We're going to find this guy. Here's the deal. I lost my temper, man. I'm sorry. Okay? This happened in real time. <laughs> Listen, put me on my uh, put me on my close camera, please. I got a little heated there. Uh, sometimes I'm from Southern Illinois. I'm from a rural area. I sometimes that swamp justice just it it bubbles up, man. It's something I'm dealing with in therapy. Sometimes people do stuff, uh, and the, I, I feel that there, I have a, I have a protector complex. It's not a good thing all the time. Sometimes it serves me well. Sometimes it doesn't. I feel obligated to protect people I love, and I love Reva McIntyre. Okay, I love this woman, uh, and you disrespected someone I love, man, and uh, that's hard for me to handle. Now, did I want to choke you out in the moment? Yes, I did. Did I want did I, did I want to open hand pimp slap you with my rings on facing the other way so it would leave a mark on your forehead or face so you'd see this this little lightning bolt and this little whatever this little imprint is like I would I wanted to see that on the side of your face and I wanted you to have to look in the mirror and see it and realize that that was for something really stupid you said about Reba McIntyre and now looking back on that that's not cool. That's not the right way to handle things. Maybe you were just making an observation. Maybe maybe you were drunk when you heard the song. Maybe uh, you have an inner ear infection. You don't have the right amount of cocula. Is that what the liquid in your ear is called? Cocula? Cocula? What's the liquid in your ear called? How do you pronounce it? What is not Coachella, God damn it. I know what Coachella is. That's the opposite of something you want in your ear. <laughs> Take that, Coachella. Fluid-filled cochlea. Your cochlea. How do you pronounce that? Cochlea. Let's find out. What the hell? Turn me up. Cochlea. What the hell? Why won't it say it? It's asking me to practice. Why can't I hear it on my computer? Try the um, video speaker next to the word. There. Legalizing sports betting will generate tens of millions well, of dollars pay for this. every year for our classrooms. Wrong. You are looking at Julian's pronunciation guide. Oh, where boy. We look at how to pronounce better. Where'd this guy come from? Pronounced words in the Welcome world. to Julian's it's pronunciation guide. Well, but how do you say what you're looking for today? An interesting word with <laughs> confusing pronunciation. A word from medicine, anatomy, neuroscience. Oh, my God. Or more names from Medicine Stadium, Cochlea. Yes, could not Cochlea or Cochlea. 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 No, you know. Here are more videos on how to pronounce more confusing <laughs> words and names. Okay, to well, he should call his video series Making Things Worse with Julian. Because there was nothing clear. It's Cochlea, not Cochlea or Cochlea. Cochlea, not Cochlea. Cochlea. Nuni. No, not Nuni. Nuni. Cochlea. Yes. I'm Antonio Banderas. I, Julian. I mean, Julian. This is not Antonio Banderas. This is a guy, a regular guy, a pronunciation guy uh, named uh, Julian. And you pronounce it uh, cochlea. Not cochlea. Cochlea. Not cochlea. Cochlea. Thank you, Julian. Now I, I'm more lost than I was before. The point is... Maybe when this guy was listening to Reba, maybe he had a dick in his ear, you know? Maybe that song came on while he was getting skull fucked, you know, at a party he didn't want to be at. So it hit him at a wrong time. I, I got to give him the benefit of the doubt, okay? Whoever you are, whoever you are, 
I think the right thing to do after I just played that song for you and I made all of my extremely strong arguments against yours is to at least admit maybe you got this one wrong. Call the hotline back. Leave. You don't have to apologize to me, dude, but you should apologize to Reba McIntyre. I would like to have an apology message on my desk by tomorrow morning. I would like to be able to come on this podcast next week and play your apology for Reba McIntyre. Now, it's going to take a big man to do that. I drug you a little bit. I threw you under the bus a bit. But you sounded like you might be a reasonable man based on your message. Let's play that message one more time because I want everyone to hear how stupid it was one more time before I delete it from the earth. This is what this guy said. Now, now we've all listened to the video. I can't handle it right now. I can't give it a right now. We heard her fucking knock it out of the park. This is what this guy had to say. Hey, Ray, listen to you every morning on the number one show. Uh, have heard you do Reba McIntyre fancy when you were doing the fundraiser or Donnie was doing the fundraiser. Uh, quick question. Don't want to offend you because we're all entitled to our own opinions. But when did Reba mail it in? I mean, at least at fancy, she is kind of enunciating words and singing. But uh, we turn it on a country station after we're done with the number one show. And every Reba song we've heard lately is there's just music in the background. And then she just like talks for three and a half minutes. Uh, just wanted to get your input on it. Keep up the good work. And delete. Bye. Goodbye. Listen, man, you sounded like a reasonable guy in that I don't understand in any way how you could not under grasp the magnitude of Reba McIntyre and what she means to the world. But that's fine. All I'm saying, dude, I've apologized for my, what may have been an overreaction on my part. I'll admit that. I'm working in that. I'm working through some things in therapy. I just turned 46. I had a very traumatic experience. I'm having an existential crisis that has been now compounded with um, slander against Reba McIntyre. That's fine. I'm a man. I can take it. I'll throw myself in front of Reba. But I think if you're a man and you listen to this or you watch this, you have to admit she's as good as she ever was. And I think a big man a true man, a real man, would sack up, grow a spine, call 1-818-532-1420 and leave a detailed apology for Reba McIntyre. Ball's in your court, man. The Ball's in your court. And that, my friends, concludes this episode, this segment of Tank Talks. We'll be back to wrap this thing up after a quick word from our sponsor, the one true queen, Reba McIntyre, and 18 North Central. Welcome back. It is me, Cochlea. <laughs> it is I, Antonio Banderas, in Cochlea. And I must say, thank you. Big thanks to our first ever sponsor, Tactical Laser Tag North, 18 North Central. Thanks for coming on board, man. We really appreciate it. I appreciate the sponsorship that helps me do cool things. It lets me know that you're a cool business. If you haven't checked it out, man, check it out. It is a cool spot. Now, what a day. Me and Riz got into some things that would blow your mind as a kid. We, uh, you know, we talked about advances in technology that would have blown your 15-year-old mind right out of the water. We got into some birthday talk. I got a little PO'd about the NFL, had a little axe to grind with all the streaming services. And we ended on a wild ride on some very damaging and false narrative about Reba McIntyre. Let me tell you something. This might have been my favorite episode of the number two show I've ever done. Just in my heart, I felt like I was really just talking to my friends and getting stuff off my chest. It felt very cathartic. After taking a week off, it felt good to be back in the saddle. I had fun. I hope you had fun. I know it's weird to ask for because everybody does it. 
and it's kind of lame. But honestly, man, it really does help if you like, subscribe, share, and leave a positive review either on Spotify or Apple or wherever you get your podcasts. I love the live chat. Live chat disappears after we do a show. But if you leave a comment on the YouTube video later or we have uh, on Spotify, the video plays concurrently. So when you open Spotify, the video comes up. It plays with it. It would really help me out if you left a positive review, a comment about something that you liked. It'll help other people discover the show, especially my show, because it's such a wild ride. I don't really fit in a genre. So when people look for true crime podcasts, they don't find me. They look for, this is a very, I, I might be creating a genre and I don't even know what it is. It's obviously, it may just be the unhinged ramblings of a wild man, but maybe that could be a genre. Who knows? It could be with your help. If you like and subscribe and you help get the word out about the number two show, share stuff when I share social media clips. If you share them, maybe people will discover the show and listen. Because I want to keep making it, and I want to keep improving it, and I want to keep having fun with you guys. And I appreciate everybody that tunes in live. I appreciate everybody that's listening on Spotify. Until next time, I am your host of the number two show, Rafe Williams. Stand-up comedian, actor, entertainer, lover of Reba McIntyre. Always, always, white front to back. I love you. See you next time on the number two show. Bye-bye.